This episode is brought to you by SRC Health. SRC compression garments have been specifically designed to provide continuous support and relief of pain during pregnancy, faster recovery after delivery and after exercise by facilitating muscle healing. The SRC pregnancy shorts and leggings are ideal for providing pain relief and assistance during pregnancy. You're watching Mummy Time TV. I'm Shezzy Denya. Today's episode is one that is pretty close to my own heart, perinatal anxiety and depression. It's not an easy topic to discuss, but it is vital to start this discussion. Most people are aware of the stereotypical symptoms of postnatal depression. We've seen it in the movies, you might have seen it on TV, etc. But what you might not realise is that anxiety and depression can actually strike before your baby is born. This is called antenatal depression and affects 1 in 10 women. Postnatal depression and anxiety affects more than 1 in 7 new mums, but many believe it could be much higher. I've had it. I've suffered from postnatal anxiety and to be honest, it was absolutely horrendous. So I'm really keen to talk to these three mums today. These three brave and wonderful mums who are sitting on the couch with me, ready to share their experiences in the hope we might be able to help someone at home. So let's meet them. First up, Lauren Patterson. Lauren is a single mum to Maddie and Max and is the creator of the popular blog, Mad Max Mum. Lauren has openly discussed suffering from postnatal depression and has helped many in the process. Hello, Lauren. Hi. And next up, please meet Mel Watts. She's a delightful mum to four little people. She's also the creator of the popular blog, The Modern Mama, which she started in 2014, where she speaks openly about her struggle with postnatal depression and postnatal anxiety and how she is learning to live with it every day. I'm really excited to have her here on the couch. Welcome, Mel. Hi, Shezzy. And finally, please say hello to the beautiful Brittany Noonan down the end. Brittany is a mummy to one little girl, Millie, with another on the way. She's a well-known motherhood fitness and wellness blogger, and she's here to discuss her experience with antenatal depression, and we're so glad to have her here. Hello, Brittany. Hi, Chevy. Okay, Lauren, let's start with you. When did you first realise that you might have been suffering from postnatal depression? Uh, Max wasn't sleeping and I just remember one day I stopped enjoying being a mum and thinking why am I looking at these two beautiful kids and not enjoying it and every ounce of happiness was gone and and I've suffered from mental illness in the past and I just knew straight away that something wasn't right and it just spiralled from there. And so what did you do? Like, did you talk to someone or did you go to your doctor? In the beginning, I tried to handle it myself. I tried to take the independent woman um, role and that just didn't work. Um, but from my experience in the past, I went straight to the doctor and doctors just put you straight on medication and that's mm. just not for me. Uh, so I just started, I started exercising a lot more and just trying to do the best that I could. And at that stage, I think I was a little bit too far gone and just knew that it was a very serious thing. I'd heard about it. I'd experienced depression in the past, but not knowing anything about postnatal depression and because I'd gone unscathed in my first pregnancy, I had no idea what to expect and it was scary. And that's confusing, isn't it? Because you had your first child and you were sleeping or it was a different experience and then you had your second and just got totally bamboozled by this change. Yeah, Maddie pulled the wool over my eyes and she was an amazing angel child sent from God and, and Max was the devil child. So <laughs> <laughs> when it got to the point where I was getting up so many times a night and he wasn't sleeping during the day and I was swearing a lot and crying a lot and the kitchen floor was my best friend because that was where I spent most of my time. I, I uh, just... I knew that my sleep deprivation and just everything that was going on in my life at that moment was contributing to it um, and I needed to make a few changes. I just didn't know what I needed to change and I couldn't make Max sleep. And I just stopped caring about 
everything because I was putting all my focus into making sure that he was okay. And then it just turned out that I was the one with the biggest problem of all. And it was scary. It, it was the scariest feeling in the world because as a mother, you want to show as much love to these children as you can. But when you're waking up and not wanting to get out of bed and you don't care about anything and you've also got a partner as well. And I didn't necessarily have a partner that I could talk to um, and go to for support. So I felt very, very lost in terms of what to do next and where to go. It's not really something that you come out and tell your friends, is it? No, and at that stage I didn't really have a lot of friends around me that were pregnant or had children. And because of my past, my family were kind of reluctant to accept the fact that I was diagnosed again mm -hmm. um, because I don't have a great history with mental health and I do have a, a very dark past and I didn't want to scare anyone. So I did internalise it a bit mm -hmm. and that was, you know, a, I would say it was a mistake. I don't like to have regrets, but internalising horrible feelings like that, I do consider it a mistake because I needed help. And it, yeah, I know what to do for myself now. I just wish I knew back then. Hi, I'm Terry Smith, Panda CEO. It's so great to see Chessie's passion for getting conversations going about emotional wellbeing, mental health during the perinatal period. We all need to keep talking about this subject. At Panda, we know how long so many of our callers wait to get help. And you know, the main reasons they, they wait so long to get help, there's two reasons. The first is often they just have no idea what's actually happening to them. We can help change that by letting them know that this is a really common and serious illness. But the second reason that mums delay calling Panda is the stigma. No one wants to be a mum who has perinatal mental illness, but you know, one in five mums will have that experience. So the more we can talk about it, the more we can break down the stigma. So great to have this opportunity. Thanks so much for your, your efforts, Jessie. You horny? <laughs> <laughs> Why this topic? I'm like the most awkward person ever. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not feeling horny. You were about 20 weeks ago. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I want to point out the obvious, but that's how the baby got in there. <laughs> Did it happen the first time? What's that? Did you fall pregnant the first time? I'm the Virgin Mary. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> no, not at all. No. Nah. No. Nah. Drier than a mule. I don't I know what a mule is. <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm picturing something really dry, like a tongue, like a dry tongue. I feel like I've read on like pregnancy websites and things about people getting like really horny when they're pregnant. I'm like, I tried. who is that? Like, is that, is that a real thing? Yeah, I tried to get real sexy and like, oh, I'm so into, <laughs> uh, uh. nah, I hated it. It was awful. What was that noise? I was like an, an African dancer. Uh, uh. <laughs> He didn't get off me either. He didn't find me very sexy. He put me like this. <laughs> okay, sorry. You can cut that. That's why it's so important to have this conversation and I can see you guys kind of nodding away. Yeah. At what point did you realise something wasn't right? Now, I have had anxiety on and off my whole life. I can remember it from when I was seven. And then it peaked to the point when I had Indy, who is now two, and I was sitting at home and I could not leave my house. Really? I, I would get in my car, I would put Aiden in the set car, I would put Ivy in the car, I'd put Indy in the car, and I'd just drive around the block because I just couldn't actually get to the final destination without being so physically ill that I just couldn't move. And then I'd just go back in the driveway and we'll or go back in the car, uh, inside the house, sorry, and that's when even my husband was like, something's not right, we need to do something. Did you, because that sounds quite crippling, did it was you feel crippling. like you were going crazy? Yes, yes. I actually, um, I thought there was so much more that was going on. Um, when I found out it was the anxiety, I seeked help straight away and went to a psychologist and we got a mental health plan and we worked through it and I just think it peaks on and off now I still get it throughout my life and I've learned to just try and deal with it the best I can and yeah I just 
It's, it's hard. It's you awful. learn to live in it. Yeah. Do you, are there things that trigger a big response from you? My baby's sick. Yep. That just ends me full stop. Yeah. Um, I, must, I must admit, I am the same. I'm waiting for a, a nod <laughs> of camera from my husband. As soon as they're sick, I'm sick. As soon yeah. as they've got a sore tummy, I've got a sore tummy. Like, I just, I play it all in my head. Um, going away from my kids, I find really quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and just going places that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I struggle then. Yeah, and like you were lucky that your husband was able to recognise that change in you. Yeah. But what about if you didn't have him and you didn't, like, did anybody else pick up that things weren't quite right? Did you have friends that you let down if you didn't turn up to events? Or I think they got used to me just letting them down. Wow. I constantly let them down. I was always such a no person. So I'd make up these big elaborate plans in my head and on days I felt great, it was an amazing idea, like... I couldn't wait and then once the day came I'm like sorry Indy's sick, Ivy's sick, Aiden's sick, I'll just use I'm sick and the list would go on till you got to the point and no one's like none of us are sick why can't we go and I'm like we're sick I feel mm. sick I can't go and it just got to the point that he would go to these things on his own with the kids and I would stay home and I just didn't want to live my life like that anymore. Yeah. Hi I'm Melissa and I'm here to talk about how I experienced perinatal anxiety and depression with all three of my pregnancies. Um, I know that you don't need to have experienced a previous mental illness to experience perinatal anxiety or depression. I hadn't had any illnesses before, uh, but after the birth of my first child, I experienced postnatal anxiety. Uh, people thought that I was actually coping really well because I was just in hyperdrive and doing everything over the top um, but that was actually a sign that I wasn't coping very well and I should have addressed that. Uh, with my second child I experienced depression so I went from loving life and absolutely loving everything about life to going to bed at night and hoping that I would die in my sleep and waking up crying that that hadn't happened. So um, yeah I know that it's not necessarily something that's already in you and that it can happen just as a result of having children. Um, I had a third pregnancy, which was twins, in which I also experienced depression, but I was prepared for that. And I had some strategies in place and it was a much better experience for our whole family. So definitely new parents, be aware and check in with yourselves and look after yourselves and other people in the community. When you know someone's having a baby or has had a baby, even if they appear okay, they might not be. So I'd say just give a bit of extra community spirit, uh, maybe drop a meal around, have a chat to them. And even if they say they're okay, just keep on checking in and making sure everyone's okay. Thank you, bye. Brittany, if we can come over to you, your experience was a little bit different because you you had anxiety and, and antenatal depression when you were pregnant. Can you take us back through your experience? I'm um, a little bit like Lauren. I'd already dealt with depression and anxiety for a long time. I'm like Mel too. Um, so I knew I knew that I had that in the past, but um, when I fell pregnant. At about five or six weeks, I um, end up with hyperemesis, which is like a severe form of morning sickness. Mm -hmm. And um, looking back on it now, I definitely think that that triggered my anxiety from, and depression, <laughs> and antenatal depression from really early on in my pregnancy because I spent so much time in and out of hospital. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy about being pregnant and that scared me because I thought, aren't we all meant to be joyful? And you know, everyone's congratulating me and oh, what a wonderful experience, what a wonderful time for you, but I didn't feel that. Um, but it took until probably, I think I was about 26 weeks pregnant when um, I was actually diagnosed by a psychiatrist to have antenatal depression and I went back on medication, on different medication to what I used to be on. Um, yeah, so 
it took a while for me to actually admit that's what it was. I think I was so numb for so long and I was trying to deal with the sickness as well. So this time I was a bit more prepared for, for it and can cope with it better. I think it's important to not put so much pressure on yourself. And a lot of mums who are sitting at home hopefully will get that message. Do you have any other messages that you think, you know, for people who might be battling away on their own? It's scary to think that there are so many women out there feeling alone through it. And the wonderful thing that these days there's so many Facebook groups and mothers groups and and all those types of things out there, um, everything with, is within hands reach mm -hmm. and that's amazing. Um, it's just taking that first step to, I think you need to admit to yourself that you're not okay first mm -hmm. and then take that step afterwards. How, um, do, you, how do you do that though? How, how do you get to that point? And I mean, that anyone can answer this. How do you, how do you because I, I knew something wasn't quite right. I became quite, angry and I would go from feeling normal to all of a sudden being having this full-blown anxiety panic attack which was not you know that was not normal but I didn't quite know how to verbalize that to anyone I think that's probably why we all have blogs yeah. Um, yeah. generally like I would use my writing as an outlet yeah. and you know what most of the time I would write at the height of my anxiety and my depression I would write and write and write and write and write and I would just let it flow and then afterwards once I'd calm down I'd read it and go oh crap do I actually <laughs> feel like that and sometimes an element of embarrassment would come over me like why why was I feeling like that because I don't feel like it now yeah and because it can then, be fleeting can't it absolutely like it, can... it just takes over and I'm still prone to it now where you know Jack needs to like grab me by the shoulders and just go Lauren calm down it's going to be okay and I just I've learned breathing techniques and stuff luckily now um, but back then I would just write you jump on the computer and be like I feel like shit I use my blog as um, it's really strange to say it out loud I know but I'm more comfortable to talk to the people that follow me and the people that actually don't know me face value than I am to talk to my friends and family so mm -hmm. I find it really awkward when my family come up to me and they knew that they knew I had anxiety, but even my, like my mum, for instance, she'd be like, I didn't know it was that bad, Mel. Why didn't you tell me? I'm like, because I'm not comfortable. Mm. I'm not comfortable to have the conversation. I feel awkward that people feel bad for me. I just, yes, the pity. I'd rather help but... other people and me just to sit back and just deal with myself. Yeah. It's, I just, yeah, the pity. I don't like the pity. And you had postnatal depression when yeah. you first had Aiden. So, you were quite young. Is that, was that? really different from the I find anxiety. it hard yeah the depression part I had I was 19 when I had Aiden and mm -hmm. I, me and his dad were living in a house together and I remember laying there one night and just going if there was a house fire this sounds awful now but Aiden was not on the top of my list to grab mm -hmm. the top of my list was my photos and my belongings and that's when I sat there I'm like this is not normal but I was wait I was just You're I didn't have unwell. support I didn't have People, So I just kind of dealt with it myself over time and it got better. Then I had Ivy and got a little bit more anxiety poured into my cup. And then I had Indy and she was just an awful child. I love her to pieces, but she was an awful baby and she just overflowed me. Like yeah. I just, I just couldn't cope with life anymore. It was just That's too That's a really much. good analogy. So when you say you couldn't cope with life anymore, were you having the same similar feelings like that you're having with Aiden? I or? wasn't depressed as such. It was just, everything was just too much for me. Like I just, I felt like my feelings were just so heightened mm. all the time. Like if someone said, I don't, I don't like the way you do something. I'm like, oh my God, like that is awful. Like, and I'll take it so personally where really it, it should have been like, that's okay. Like I understand that, but I was just really constantly sensitive. on the high, like Nolan barely survived. <laughs> The poor guy, but um, yeah, did the best I could. So did yeah. you find that there is a big difference between postnatal depression and postnatal anxiety? Yeah, I felt postnatal depression, I was sad. Postnatal anxiety, I am constantly scared. Right. And scared of what I don't know. I'm just scared. And that's how you felt with your anxiety? Your, uh, with my depression. With your depression. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
I just felt so numb. Like it was just like, people would just be like, oh, you know, you're so sick. I feel so sorry for you. Are oh, you okay? And I'd just be like, just felt nothing. Like I felt sad when I was alone, but when people would ask me, I just felt like nothing, no emotions, no, no like nothing. And there was nothing, like my belly was growing and I knew there was a baby in there, but I was like so disconnected from it. And I just, I just didn't feel like I had any emotions towards anything about becoming a mum. I lost like the emotions between my partner at the time. Like it was just, yeah, like there was nothing there. So for me, same when you say like with the anxiety, it's more like you're so scared all the time. You're always high, like it's like this heightened, you're just always high, like high, um, high emotions. Whereas when you have depression, you're just so, I, I was so numb, so low and so numb. It's mm. almost like when you have depression, you feel nothing but when you have anxiety you feel everything, everything. times a thousand yeah it's a really great way um, to describe yeah. it and just going back to what you said about um at the start about like reaching out to people mm. and how mel said that she feels more comfortable speaking you know to people she doesn't know i feel exactly the same way but you just have to recognize within yourself that okay one you're not okay like you need to take that step you're not okay but that's okay and if you don't if, if you don't feel like you can tell your husband don't tell him go and seek some professional help yeah if that's if that's comfortable for you tell your friend if that's comfortable for you just find the person that you are comfortable with talking to because i still i'm not that comfortable with talking with my husband about it um but i will talk to my psychologist my psychiatrist easily find someone do you think that's because you feel guilty like it's definitely yeah because um especially in pregnancy because obviously it's a happy time and well, it should be a happy time and for my husband he's a lot older than me and he tried for a really long time in his first marriage to have children and he couldn't um they couldn't have children so obviously like he wanted this his whole life he wanted it his whole life and then i wasn't excited and i wasn't happy and i felt so much guilt so much guilt and i felt guilty to that baby as well mm. um yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, and when, I mean, so it's, it's really hard to talk about and, and I'm really appreciative that you're being, you know, so honest. Hi, my name is Lara. I um, suffered really bad mental illness after both births of my children. Um, I had uh, relatively short periods of pretty extreme postnatal anxiety and I'd never ever had any mental illness at all prior um, to becoming a mum. Um, I found it incredibly frightening because I didn't know what to expect and I certainly didn't know how to handle it at first. Um, but what I'd like to sort of tell new mums or new dads that are experiencing this is that you can recover and you do recover um, and I was able to recover relatively quickly. Did you when when your baby was born when millie was born did you feel like you bonded okay then did it change yeah yep yeah. um i was so sick the entire pregnancy i was sick when they were wheeling me in to have my cesarean so um i was sick the entire time and as soon as i'd had her and the morphine wore off i was no longer sick and that just felt like a whole entire like the world was lifted off my shoulders i was hungry i could eat and I literally remember laying there, it was like two o'clock in the morning and I could just see her in the little crib next to me. And I just was looking at her and I was just thinking, I can do this, like I love this little baby. I actually do love her and she, I can already tell that she loves me back and I can actually do this and I can be a good mum. It was just that that experience happened but it doesn't define who I was in that moment mm. and I just couldn't believe how much like I felt like that weight had been lifted just by not feeling sick anymore and actually having her there that's a really just, great I couldn't perspective. feel that connection like I had no connection I don't know I feel like there's a lot of pressure on us as women to yeah. have this bond while we're pregnant but for some of us it just doesn't exist like it's not there so and that's okay and now I realize that that's okay did you find that you had a bond when Max was born? I knew from the minute when they came into the world, yes. Um, I honestly, through pregnancy, I never really enjoyed pregnancy, mainly because I didn't really have the relationship that I had dreamed of having when I was having kids. So, you know, I never got the happy family pregnancy photos and someone coming shopping with me. So, 
I think the only bond that I needed to rely on was the one with my baby because I didn't have the right bond with their dad. And the minute they came into the world, it was just kind of like, I'm scared, but I'm going to do it. And, you know, I'm still scared to this day, but I've moved on and grown a lot since then. But at the time, like, I, I don't remember ever enjoying pregnancy and it wasn't because I was depressed. It was more along the lines of it just wasn't what I'd pictured. So the bond's, the bond's there and I, I love my children to death. I just wasn't sure during pregnancy because I just didn't enjoy it. And how about you, Mel? We're all getting a bit um, teary. We may need to get the <laughs> tissues. Um, with Aiden, I think... I, I don't know, I don't remember. I am really awful for just blacking things out. I deleted all my pregnancy photos. I have no nothing to remind me of my pregnancy with why, Aiden. Why did you do that? Hated how I looked, hated how I felt. I had no friends left because I was 19 and it was just... And they were all going out. And they were all going out, going to uni and I was at home by myself pregnant and I had no license. It was just a very sad time. Um, but I did connect with him, like I loved him, but I just didn't feel like I loved him, like I was meant to love him. Um, Ivy and Indy and Sunny, I was a lot older and I think I kind of, I had grown as an adult and I knew what it was like to be a mother. So I had, I connected with them a lot easier. Then, the, yeah. the expectation is that you will, like as Lauren said, you know, go shopping with your partner and, and be fit and glowing and happy and it's not always that way and every one of us has a very different story. Yeah. Um, I guess what, you know, what advice do you give to mums who are sitting at home, you know, feeling like their picture perfect family isn't working out the way that they hoped? That no one's picture perfect family is working out the way they hoped. Like everyone has their struggles in life and Every relationship has their struggles and it's just time, time goes. Like it really does. Like Aiden turns 12 this year and 12 years ago, I don't feel like I had a baby. Like he's grown up so much so quickly and I feel like we need to get help when you need help, ask for help and just know that you're going to be okay. Like it's going to be okay. It really will be. poo after after birth um mine was freaking painful yeah i think mine was about the same because i ripped hold a hole oh. Oh. <laughs> my bottom's just got really tight thinking about that that's why I, that's why i enjoy a good quiet poo now because <laughs> i know what it feels like to have a really painful one. Oh my god did you have stitches well i didn't get i didn't get hold a hole because I pooed really big, I had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. Oh my God, I don't even know where to go from there. Far out. I thought mine was bad because I was so pumped full of, of the medication because I had emergency caesareans that it's like a bunch of pebbles and they give you like this really gross drink and say this will, you know, help and it doesn't and you, that first poo is so painful and you just want to put your finger in there and <laughs> help it out a bit. I had natural births so I just remember being told you're not allowed to leave until you poo and I like a challenge so I was <laughs> <laughs> I was willing to bust those stitches because I just wanted to go home. Oh my gosh did they have to give you painkillers to do the poo? I just really wanted to go home. <laughs> <laughs> to poo in your own house? Well no because I don't often get to poo alone these days but <laughs> <laughs> you never knew how bad your pooing was going to get back then, did you? No, but now I just know to eat rye bread and you're good. Oh. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves as mums. Do you forgive yourself for, you know, for how you felt at each of those points with your different children? Like with Aiden, you know, in the house fire and, and like 
you know, down the track when you had anxiety with with your younger children. Do you do you look at that and you think, you know what, I did the best that I could? Yeah, because I did do the best. It may not have been someone else's best, but it was my best at the time and I grew through it and I'm a great mum to those kids. Like, I'm the best mum they've got and they're going to have to enjoy it and forgive me for it because I've got them where they are now and I'm doing okay. And kids actually need very little. They yeah, need they a lot need of love. Anything. Mm. Well, besides food and love. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Like, they're very resilient. If that's the right word. So, so tips on managing, handling, um, you know, anxiety and also the postnatal depression. Can you, can you talk us through some of the things that have worked for you? Yeah. Take... Each day as it comes and some days you may not want to shower and you don't have to shower just take baby steps um, know that your kids don't know what's going on so they aren't judging you although you feel like you're letting them down they actually have no idea um, and go and ask someone for help like there's so many people even if you don't want to speak face to face there's phone numbers there's hotlines there's groups there's someone there who's happy to help you. Yeah. Do you put a lot less pressure on yourself now? In this pregnancy? Mm. I do now. Um, the first like three or four months. Up until about 16 weeks, I could definitely feel myself slipping back to where I was before. And I think it's really triggered by how sick I've been. Um, but I got to about 16 weeks and I just remember waking up and I just thought, you need to take control. Like you need to take control because you don't want to be that person that you were last time. And you've worked so hard in the last nearly three years to be better. So yeah, I definitely am starting to put less pressure on myself now. And um, my husband can see that. He's even said that to me, that he can see that, like he can see change in me in the last few weeks. So, but yeah, when you're right in the middle of it, you do still put that same pressure on yourself. But um, coming back to what you said about feeling guilty, um, I felt so guilty and I still do feel guilty for the thoughts that I had because I had thoughts about myself in my first pregnancy like I don't care if I don't wake up tomorrow, I don't want to wake up tomorrow, like I hate saying this but like I'd be so sick and I, sometimes I'd go to the hospital and be like if there's no heartbeat I won't be upset like um, and I still do have those guilty moments but then I just remind myself that that was that person speaking, that's not me. So. There's a lot of shame in, in thinking those thoughts. So, you know, I can understand why you wouldn't want to talk to your husband about that. That would be hard. And I guess that's the same for a lot of mums who are suffering from antenatal anxiety. And it's quite different and not many people know about it, do they? No, and there's still so much stigma attached to it because I think everywhere you look in the media, social media, every parenting website everyone just looks so happy so yeah. happy to be pregnant and you're you're sitting there and you're not happy like and you think oh this isn't this isn't okay like it's not okay for me to feel like this but it is actually okay for you to feel like that and admitting that you feel okay is that it is okay to feel that way is the first step in seeking like getting better seeking help as soon as you admit to yourself that it's okay to feel that way you're okay to talk to somebody else about it so was there great relief when somebody diagnosed you with antenatal depression? Um, that there was a title that you knew what you were suffering with? I think I already knew. I think I knew deep down because I've had um, anxiety and depression for a long time. I already knew, but um, I think it felt like there was pressure taken off me um, more like with other people. So I mm -hmm. felt like I didn't have to feel so ashamed to my husband, to my OB, you know, to people that are around me, like they could think that was more okay than I felt that way. So yeah, I guess some of the shame was taken away by that diagnosis. And tips for people at home who might be suffering? Um, definitely admitting to yourself that it's okay that you feel that way. Seeking help, This, like Mel said, there's so many ways that you can get help these days. Um, just going and doing it, finding that person that you can talk to. Um, exercise for me is a big one can't exercise right now because I've been too sick, but um, exercise, practicing meditation, practicing mindfulness techniques. Um, it, when you're really anxious or when you're really in that moment, there's a lot of grounding techniques you can learn. 
I mean, all this stuff's really accessible online as well. You get apps for all this stuff if you don't really want to talk to anybody, but really seeking like professional help, you will learn all these things. So that would probably be my biggest tip is to get that professional help because it's not really just about you either. You do have a baby to worry about as well. Mm. And now it's time for an important titbit. Titbit! I'm sitting here today with the beautiful Sinead from SRC Health. Hello, Sinead. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Why do you think women need your products, SRC products? We feel that women need them because there are a number of very common conditions um, during pregnancy and also um, after delivery that women suffer with. So if we say go back to pregnancy, uh, the more common things are low back pain, pelvic girdle pain, varicose veins, mild varicose, mild varicose veins of their legs, um, vulval veins, which aren't as common or people don't speak about them so much, um, but they're nonetheless very painful. Um, recovery, cesarean section, vaginal delivery with stitches or tears, which are which can be very, very painful. Um, and of course, more commonly DRAM, which is separation of their abdominal muscles. And you're also a big supporter of Panda. Can you tell huge, me about that? Huge, absolutely huge. Wonderful organisation. Um, our uh, marketing guru, Jean, works really closely with them. And obviously we treat women physically, but I think there's an extension of that because if you're pain free and you feel good and you can go about your day, it influences you um, emotionally and psychologically. You feel better. Um, so your mental health is better. Um, and that's, that's I think that's a wonderful association between SRC and Panda. We help them physically, they help them emotionally, but we work together and they have a holistic approach to their uh, pregnancy or their recovery. Before having children, I'd never experienced any depression or anxiety. I'll be completely honest, I just didn't think that was something that would happen to someone like me. So when I had my eldest daughter in 2014 and I was experiencing depression and anxiety, my, I guess my initial instinct was to pretend like I was okay to not accept help. I felt guilty and I was just in like the highest level of denial. I pretended on the outside that I was okay, but on the inside, I truly felt trapped and I felt paralyzed by these feelings that I was feeling. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night in a sweat because I just felt like I could not move on with my life but I was just so, it was so hard for me to accept that what I was experiencing was not normal. Um, and perhaps the hardest thing for me was to ask for help. I just didn't think it would happen to somebody like me. And when it did, I didn't know what to do. And I just wish that at the time I had sought help so much earlier than I had, because I truly feel like perhaps my experience of motherhood would have been different to what it was. Hi Lauren, any tips to add to those? I honestly, in the darkest pits of it, I push myself to go outside. Um, I spend, you know, I live alone with the kids and when the kids are with their dad, I am alone and I only have myself to rely on. So generally, I, I've just learnt from going through the worst of it over 12 years that pushing myself to get outdoors and even just to go to the shops and smile at someone who works at Woolies. Putting a smile on their face puts a smile on my face. Um, it's just really simple things and also, you know, meditation and mindfulness. I'm, I'm one of those ones that, you know, my friends call me a bit of a hippie, but it makes me feel better. And then even, and this comes back to social media, just getting on the Instagram stories, I don't even I don't like talking on Instagram stories, but once I get up there and I start going, it's just like a word vomit. And at the end of it, I'm like, oh, I feel better. That feels nice. Mm. And, and then there's everything else as well, like going and seeking help, every, everything that should be those first steps. And, and once you have admitted to it and you've gone and got help and gone and see your doctor, I've always found that the follow-up and taking ownership and taking control of your situation yourself 
starts to take ease off the situation, uh, so adds ease to the situation, mm -hmm. and also makes you feel so empowered that you are now doing this for yourself. And it's like I've gone through the worst of this and now I'm getting myself out of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just the most amazing feeling because I will have the best days where it's like I'm making sure that I'm making sure everyone else is okay. And then on my bad days, I'm like, okay, what do I do for everyone else? Now I need to use it on myself. And, you know, going to the gym and doing everything, just little things one step at a time you, there's no miracle cure for it i wish there was but it's just finding what works for you and remembering what makes you happy and not losing yourself in it mm -hmm. and keeping that there and using it every time you need to it's a difficult process but talking does help too doesn't absolutely. it absolutely and just um one thing no one ever talks about because it is a bit of a you know to be subject to is medication if you need medication there's no shame in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it for yourself because sometimes without it, you just can't find that balance to go and help yourself even more. Like I just find, found when I was on medication that it, it balanced me out enough to be able to go and learn all these other things yeah. so then I could come off the medication. Yeah, But yeah, no one wants to talk about it or say, oh, it's okay to be on medication. Most oh. people say, oh, you know, you don't want to do that. You just can turn into a zombie or whatever, but it's, it's okay. There and yeah. there is a lot of fear around medication. So I yeah. think it's a good point that you raised that. Thank yeah. you. And do you still, you know, do you still have medication while you're pregnant? Um, this time I'm not on like a regular um, medication for it. Yeah. My last pregnancy I was the whole time. Um, I came off it once I had Millie. I just decided that it's time for me to come off it. But if I got to that point where I felt like I needed it again, I would. But I do have um, some medication that I take if my anxiety is really high. And I'm yeah. not ashamed of that. That's, you know. It helps. Yeah, and the, the stress that my body goes under when I'm in that panic or if I'm having a panic attack, even my OB and my psychiatrist said to me, that's way worse than that medication that you're, gonna t that you're taking for the baby. So. And you're the same, Mel? The I take sleeping tablets when I'm away from the kids. Mm -hmm. I take gastro stop on a regular basis when I go out to places I'm not familiar with. Gastro stop? Yeah, so, because that's part so of my upset. anxiety yeah. is my stomach just doesn't like me. Yeah. And just goes crazy. So I take that and if I need to, I'll take anti-nausea tablets. But I do have natural stress and anxiety tablets I take. Sounds like my medicine cabinet. <laughs> I'm not. But I was for a I know. <laughs> I may rattle when I'm I shake. I'm actually a medicine cabinet. I'm like a medicine cabinet at the moment, but that's for like all my anti-nausea medication. Oh. So it's okay. You poor thing. Yeah. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for today. But before we finish up, a total change of pace um, to what we've been discussing. We do um, a word association game. Mm. You know, <laughs> just using the um, magic of TV and I reach behind here. Why did boobs come to my head instantly? That's my answer to everything. <laughs> wow, <laughs> have you been looking at my car? <laughs> so I'll start um, with Lauren. And boobs. Not. I'll start with boobs. <laughs> uh, with boobs. I'll start with Lauren and then we'll, we'll go down this way. Yep. Um, just say the first thing that comes into mind when I say the first word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> boobs. Sex. Boobs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, she wanted to say it. Lost. Alone. Penis. Not right now. <laughs> I love that. Friends. Support. Sleep ins. Never. Laughter. More? I want more of that. Vagina. Huh. Was that a word? Next. Okay, we may need to come back to that. <laughs> Family. Always. Scream. Millie. Body image. Healthy. Tiredness. Four children. And it's a really bad one for you, but eating. <laughs> Vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So how are you feeling since you had Chloe? Oh, it's not just not the same, is it? Um, abdominals are a bit worse for wear, the blood is not the same. You need to get yourself a pair of these SLC recovery pants. Oh, wow. They're so good. They hold you in nice and tight. Very supportive. I've been wearing them ever since the baby was born. 
I didn't know you had a baby. Yeah, Jack. Thank you so much for coming in and telling your story today and being so open and brave. It's not an easy topic to discuss and I know that we'll be helping lots of mums at home. Um, as a thank you, I just wanted to give you, Britt, this is for you, it's SRC recovery, sorry, yeah. pregnancy leggings. We've got a pair of um, SRC recovery shorts for you thank now. Thank you. <laughs> and a pair of women's compression leggings, SRC, um, for Lauren. Thank you. Thank you so much. You'll find all the information that we've spoken about today on our Mummy Time website. You will also find contact information for each of the mums in case you want to ask them any follow-up questions. Um, if you are feeling alone, if you are feeling sad or think that you might be suffering from postnatal depression or antenatal depression, you can either call the number that, we'll be, that we have on your screen right now, that's the Panda hotline, or you can head to our website for more information. Make sure that you speak to someone, even if it is just your doctor. Thank you. Mummy Time TV. This episode of Mummy Time TV was proudly brought to you by SRC Health. SRC compression garments have been specifically designed to provide continuous support to mums during pregnancy and faster recovery after delivery and exercise.